for inviting me. And, and please do ask questions when you have some. <laughs> yes. Yes. And if my pronunciation of some of the words are strange, so please do ask. So, yes. Um, yes. Uh, I I don't know exactly the background, so I take some what I think would be interesting. And in some fields, I think you are better than me because you are more biochemical than me. I'm more thermochemical and more in the biomass production. So hopefully together we can make this very good, I hope, yes. And if you say this we have already done many times, we just skip it and, and move forward, please. Yeah. And the same goes for you if you think this. <laughs> yes, first of all, I just want to explain, I come from a small university compared to UGM, 15,000 students. And we have don't have that many faculties. We have five, including music, fine arts, humanities, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, business school, of course, socioeconomics. But we don't have agriculture. Um, but as you can see, my education is agriculture engineering. So it should be the same title as you get when you finish, I think. Yes, so I think they're similar. So in my education, it was mainly machi farm machinery and farm buildings. Uh, and then I have been advisor for horticultural producers in irrigation, cold storage, yeah, whatever you can imagine, seeding, so yes. So it's in the last 32 years, I have lived in Norway, but I come from this dot, you can see in the, <laughs> The sea, that is an island where I come from originally. I started in Copenhagen, Denmark, and then I moved to Norway, to this part, where we have those 15,000 students. And I did so, some, this is a willow, salix, and botanical, and that is established as cuttings, which means this is a clone. And I can say this was in April this year, and in September, you can see the growth is nearly four meter. So even in our climate, it, it can grow fast. And we were discussing, when do we have this growth? And I had a German student, and he measured every hour for two days the height of 15 plants. And then he found out that in the middle of the day, we have a growth of four millimeter in the best clone, which is tortoise. And even during the night without sunlight, we are at one millimeter, next day four. So it means we have five centimeter per day or something. Of course, we cannot compete with bamboo, <laughs> but still for us. And of course, when we make biomass for food, feed, energy, the growth is important, yes, yes. And just to show you how it looks where I have my office, I have my office behind this window in, in the fourth floor. And we have a one building campus, very different to yours, I think. And so if you come for an exchange semester, you will discover something different, yes. So, and, but it's nice when we have snow like last week and it's freezing, it's nice to be indoor, yes. And so this is the campus, very close to the sea, and next to Denmark. And then the latest building, because every year, not every second year, they raise a new building. And the last building from this summer is a new battery research facility with the industry and our battery researchers. Yes. Yes. So as I said, agriculture engineering, and for me, it means I teach bioenergy uh, on bachelor and PhD level. I have a colleague from Bangladesh teaching on the masters. And then I teach building physics, because we need to insulate our buildings. So we put 25 centimeters of mineral wool into our walls to resist the cold. And of course, when you put a lot of insulation into the wall and you also have wood, then you have a risk of condensation and fungi and so on, which can detrize the wood. 
So my teaching is about making a building to resist uh, rain, humidity, heat, cold, all, yes. So I have 100 students in building physics and 15 in, in bioenergy. And then my research interests are quite broad. Uh, I will come back to most of this. Uh, also combustion gasification. And, but I have other fields with is sustainable buildings where I have two PhDs working, actually four, sorry, four, working in indoor air quality and cross-laminated timber. This is cross-laminated timber, this in opposite way around, and that is very popular in Norway, and we are used to wooden buildings. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, and this, and this is the willow here, where we cut it and then cut it with a wood chipper into small chips, which can be utilized for biogas, for combustion, for gasification, biochar. Yes, so far so good, I hope. Yeah, you don't sleep yet, no? I understand that, good. <laughs> yes. Okay, so when I describe my field, it's mainly characterization. What kind of heating value, what is the carbon content, the volatile, and when you do this kind of characterization, have you measured the heating value? Have you? Have you measured the heating value in the lab? No? You know when you buy chocolate or marmalade, you can see the kilojoule per 100 grams. That's measured in a bump calorimeter. And, and when you do this, you take just one and a half gram. And if you take one three and say, okay, the heating value is is accurately 19.2 Y basis per megajoule per kilogram, then you don't know because there's a variation within the tree or within the grass. So you need to be careful about the sampling because we have very accurate instrument, but if the sampling will take your pieces in, and if you're measuring the volatile, the gases, then you use just 15 milligrams. Yes. So it's important to do how to make the samples. And then I'm connected to different applications. And in Denmark, I worked with straw, but that is not relevant in Norway. So I work mainly with tree or woody species. And then as I mentioned, we work with indoor air quality, wood and health. And this photo are from Grimstad, where we have Miscanthus, Giganteus, uh, elephant grass, some sorrel, and, and willow. So it's three meter high grass, which for us is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, then just to explain the background for our research, the photo shows actually gas from a gasifier. It means we have heated some wood by igniting a part of it, but not complete combustion. And then we get this combustible gas out, which is called a producer gas. And if we try to clean it and adjust it, we get a syn gas where we can produce liquid biofuels by the fischer tropsch syn synthesis. But we did not, so what we did was we started to grow energy crops and we started to work on cookstoves for developing countries. We got a Stoker fired biomass boiler. Boiler means we burn it for hot water production. That's why it's a boiler. And then we circulate the water. So we can have underfloor heating, we can radiators to give the heat in, in the house, which we need. Yeah. Uh, in my house now, we use 20 kilowatt hours per day to heat it. Yes. And then we came into a new campus, so I got a combustion lab with three chimneys. I like to burn stuff, yes. Yeah. And then we got the first PhD in gasification, uh, another one in biochar, but not biochar for agriculture, biochar for metal production in the industry. And I'll explain that later on. And then we got a second one, 
who are working on pellets, how to make mechanical stable pellets out of biochar charcoal. And then we got a colleague, he got one PhD in, in biofuse hydrothermal liquefaction, high pressure and temperature, and you make a crude oil. And then we got a research council project together with the industry, again on biocarbon for silicon, silicon for solar cells, photovoltaic cells. Yeah. And then we have applied for a new project for three more years on that. No answer before Christmas. And then we are now uh, have hired a new PhD. And the latest uh, initiative, we are in a network now for forest byproducts, charcoal, resin, tar and potash. So I'm in the management committee. So you can see this is not very biochemical, uh, but, prof but Dr. Francis asked me to <laughs> say something about that. Even you are the experts, so I will try. So you can help me. Yes, so we did also grow wheat canary grass. So harvesting to measure the yield, the moisture content, uh, yield of dry matter per hectare and so on. So we harvested in late winter when the snow was gone as a dry material for combustion. We. University of Akta has also a small campus in a monastery at, in Greece, the islands Lesbos, close to Turkey. And they had this problem that when they have guests on courses, seminars, that they made too much uh, wastewater to the septic system. So always overflow. So I went down for 40 or 48 hours, digging holes in the field, measuring the infiltration, which should be around 1,000 part of what you see here. So one, one meter will be one millimeter in soil. And then I was calculating with the precipitation in the summer. Uh, yes, in the summer, the measured infiltration and the expected evapotranspiration the size of the field I needed. Yeah. So I turned out to 400 square meter. And then we planted eucalypt, poplar, willow, oleander, things like that. And then I can use the wood for heat. Yes. Yes. We also, the students, they get a project every year where they get uh, tin cans or cans of tins. And then they need to make a cook stove and measure the effect in kilowatt, like you do with LPG home, perhaps, because that is how what you replace. And you can see there's a lot of gases in the wood. And, and then they're measuring the efficiency, the power, and the emissions of, of carbon monoxide. Yes. And I have a big fireplace, because if you have a lot of students, they need space. As I have to stay there for one week, with three groups at a time, then it's much easier. And we moved that also into a small research project, where we are looking into how much carbon is left in the residual biochar. Because when the flames are gone, we still have some charcoal left. And you can see we have quite high carbon content in the residual biochar. And we are trying to help uh, different organizations in Ethiopia that is um, mainly on avoiding burn in Addis Ababa. Here is to use uh, local waste. I'm approaching the waste, <laughs> coffee husk in Somalia. And we have another one here for Zambia. So this is a research field too, actually. Yeah. And just to show some fun, this is a taxi, local taxi from the Second World War, where they could not get any gasoline or petrol. And then they used trunks of wood, seven by seven by seven centimeters in this bag, putting that into a closed container, ignite it, and then go for coffee 
because it will take some time before you have the right temperature to get a pure gas, which you can use for the engine. And that was only, not only for taxis, it was for tractors, for lorries, for fish boats, and so on. And there was a lot of patents in, in this field. And this is my gasifier. So this is 100 liter of wood, and then the very small amount of air, not complete for combustion, goes down, it's cleaned, and then you can see the flare for the gas, but when the flare is fine, it goes into this natural gas engine, the spark ignition, and produce five kilowatt of electricity for the batteries, and then we have an inverter to make uh, alternating current. And then we have the heat. So it's a small combined heat and power plant, very small. Yes. And we also did something on sugarcane bagasse. Again, that's perhaps more a residual, I don't know. Um, so we got 1.2 tons of sugarcane bagasse from India. And the idea was to burn it in the boiler take the ash and, and mill it in a ball mill to powder, and then we place cement in concrete, and then measure the strength afterwards in concrete. And the idea is that you have silicon in the, in the residue, a little bag gas, and if you have amorphous silicon, then it's like glue, like cement, it binding the particles together. Uh, and it w you can replace 5, 10, 15 percent of the cement and make it more green. The problem is in India, and perhaps here too, you need the silicon as a neutron for the plants, which you have a lack of. I'm not sure about it. I know in India it's like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not in soil science. No. <laughs> but but that's, that's an important plant neutron, which you should not put into concrete. So we stop the project. Yes. yes, just to show what we do when we make uh, crude oil from from sewage sludge, from algae, and so on, we have a small reactor, very small, 40, 65 milliliters, and then we heat it and get 350 bars, 500 degree, and we do this in this heater. And then we get a crude oil, which need a refining afterwards. Yes. Yeah, this is the system in the lab. Okay, now I'm finished this introductory part, and we'll move into the topic for today. But you can see it's connected. Yes, what we're doing is a little bit of the same. Okay, so actually, I could talk on this the next hour or five, <laughs> because everything is in this uh, figure, which I made and put into a book too. So when I, I'm going to talk about residues and waste, but it starts with the sun and the photosynthesis, we get the biomass. And then the nice thing about biomass is we can store it and use it for the most optimal application. And food, feed, it could be whatever. And then we have different conversion processes according to the final application. So number one is, of course, solid fuels like, like uh, wood locks for heating in our <laughs> need. We can make biochar. We can make this producer gas from gasification where we add some oxygen. When we make biochar, we get actually also normally pyrolysis oil, yes, uh, which is a very high water containing oil. You know the conversion process, I'm sure, to ethanol if you are from biochemical. And biogas will again bacteria into methane. So, yes, so fermentation and anaerobic digestion. We can have bacteria and algae producing pure hydrogen, but the efficiency is extremely poor so far. And the last one is pressing or extraction of vegetable oils. Yes. 
kick up. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm asked to talk about is how to come from the biomass and into some of the products. Yes. So first of all, where do we f find the feedstock? And and we need to compete about the feedstocks because nowadays, of course, we can make energy, biofuel, heat, and of course, food and feed or fodder for animals. That is a traditional <laughs> uh, way of utilizing biomass. But in the future, it can be used, of course, for construction, if it's wood, but also it can be used for insulation and so on, uh, boards, we have bioplastics, where we reply, place oil, fossil oil, packaging materials, uh, fine ingredients for food or for medicine, uh, which are here, pharmaceuticals, textiles, and health. So in the future, we need to treat our biomass well, because there's a lot of applications. That should mean the farmer can are able to earn money because a lot of companies would actually like his products, the biomass. Yes? So if I go into the different fields, I, I start with silviculture, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so if we look into residues here, then in a way we have woody residues like branches and tops from trees. We have pruning and tree circular residues like here too. Thinning, we let normally distance regulation. And then we can have, if we don't have enough, short rotation forestry or short rotation copies, the willow or poplar. But then we are on the energy crops. If I move in, and this is willow in snow. This is soybeans from Illinois, you know, his. And you see, then again, I can have some crops where the main could be energy, but I'm looking into residues. So what would you call residues in this list? I think I should ask you this time. Is that, yeah, waste or residues. I think residues in a way is the remaining material when you have a basic process, but waste is more from a different process. As if you are producing grain, you get something. But if you are in the city, you more talk. I think it's a little bit difficult to, <laughs> but normally residues is a kind of byproduct from the main agricultural process. And then if you more go into the industry, and of course, municipal solid waste, then it's more waste. But hopefully that could become a feedstock, yes, a raw material. So my question to you, if we look not into the main products, but the residues, residual byproduct, okay, I can answer myself. Number one, if I produce grain from rice or barley, wheat, then I get actually straw, yes, which my PhD is in <laughs> straw combustion. And so that's one material we can use. Another material is the, the husk from the grain itself and also the stoves from maize or corn. Yes. When we produce uh, oil, vegetable oil, we get seed case, yes. and the seed case can be used from, depending on the seeds, for feeding animals. We do that with rap or rape, yes. Um, you do it especially with soybeans, where you take the remaining part and feed pigs and, and cattle, yes. And bagasse, you know, from sugarcane. Yeah? And and if you produce beer, you get distiller's grain. And then, of course, for animal production, you get manure and slurry. You have the bedding material, as is what you have below the animals, and you get litter. So all this, in a way, are, for me, residues. Residues from the milk production, the meat production, from the grain production. But then we have, of course, the aquaculture. So we can supplement, with, for instance, the water hyacinth, which you see on the picture. 
But then I move into waste. So we can talk about how to convert food waste, waste oils, textiles, sewage sludge, municipal solid waste, meal waste, as it like sawdust, uh, wood shavings, and then we have paper and pulp and so on. So this is the resources we can look into. And most of them are quite wet, and that's why the biochemical system is good. Straw is normally very dry, so that fits into the thermochemical. The thermochemical, except for the hydrothermal liquefaction, we need dry material. So for waste and residues, it's nice, it's good that you have chosen in a way to work biochemical. Yes. And then just to explain the overall numbers, if we have woody materials, then we are normally are low in ash. If it's fresh wood, half of that is actually water. Very dry wood, perhaps eight percent. And if we heat it, then we will get combustible volatiles. That is the flames you see when you burn which you don't get when you have uh, charcoal, because charcoal is produced by removing the volatiles. And that is actually 70 to 80 percent of the dry matter. And then we have the remaining, it called uh, fixed carbon or, or charcoal. If you look into wood, into straw or grasses, I know for rice you can have a much higher ash content. But for normal grain like barley, rye, oats, wheat, that is the level. And normally it's quite dry. And we still have combustible volatiles. And if you take the water free energy content, then it's normally between 19 and 20 megajoule per kilogram. And if you have 20%, then it's 15, 16. And then 11, 12, if we have more than half as water. And then I talk about the lower heating value. Yes. Yeah. yes, so this is the main, except I forgot to mention that if you see wood, please remember that actually half of that is carbon. That's why, in a way, we can have this sequestration of carbon in organic material in wood, yes. We have between five and six percent of hydrogen, and then remain main part is actually oxygen. And if we burn biomass, then we use the oxygen for the combustion. Yes. Yes, and please do ask if yeah. Okay. So just to in a way, give an overview of the different processes. So this is from a textbook. You can see that's a chapter number <laughs> from one. And you see, if you start with the biomass on the top, the first I have added on the left-hand side is the physical conversion, where we produce plant oil by pressing, dust by milling, pellets by and briquettes by pressing, bales by pressing, and then chips, chunks by wood chippers, and so on. So that's one way to convert it into fuels, actually, solid fuels. The next one is the pure chemical process, where we take the plant oil and make fatty acid methyl esters, that means biodiesel, which we then can convert further. If you, yes. And the next one is your field, the biological conversion, where we make either ethanol or biogas. And then the last one is the thermal conversion, where we use heat first to make torrefaction. Torrefaction means we heat wood or whatever to temperatures above 200. And then some of the volatiles would leave, and we will get a product close to fossil coal. And what happens in Europe is next to the power plant for coal, they put a torrefaction unit, huge, and, and then they replace the coal, the torrefied wood. Yes. 
instance, in Amsterdam. The next level is the pyrolysis, normally above 400 degrees, where we heat without air and get charcoal if, or char, biochar, and oil and some non condensable gases. If we going higher, say five, six, seven, eight hundred, ah, seven, eight hundred degree, and add a small amount of air, but not enough for combustion, we make a combustible gas. And if we add enough air for complete combustion into carbon dioxide, water vapor, and so on, it's combustion. So for me, this is the main picture. Yes. And then I can ask you, have you been all those blocks? Are they a part of your education? H have you heard about all? Huh? The biochemical. Yes. Yeah. But you asked me to talk about that, so I mean, <laughs> come with it. <laughs> yes. So let's see. Perhaps you are even better after today. Yes. So today, the main part will be the biochemical because you asked, and then the chemical conversion, and then of course pressing. Yes, to make the oh, yes, and then see how it works with the time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So. Now I'd like to introduce a new word, perhaps bioeconomy. Have you have you heard the word before? Bioeconomy? Somehow? Huh? No. So bioeconomy earlier was everything where we replace fossil oil with biomass. But nowadays it's much more differentiated in a way. So in the bioeconomy, we try to separate the biomass into high value products so we earn more money and can use biomass in, in a lot of different kinds of industry and and then we try to make it a circular bioeconomy because the nutrients we always like to get back to the field to the biomass so and the lowest level we can make that is in a way just wood as uh, firewood the next level is we make power and heat, electricity and, and heat. And then we can make uh, transportation fuels, as a biofuels for engines on lorries and, and aviation, as for aircraft and so on. So that is not well, very well paid, but better than just heat. In the next level, we can make fertilizers, materials and bulk chemicals like lactic acids and so on. And then the next level, and that's good, this is the next level, food and feed. And I can say just an information that 70% of the arable land in Denmark is used for feed production, not food, <laughs> to feed all the animals which we are meat exporting. Yes. Uh, and then on the top, we have the really expensive part, pharmaceuticals and, and fine chemicals. And you can see the volume is a pyramid because of we have not a big amount, but that is not a very big problem. I just took some text from the same article. If you take the liter from hogweed, hogweed is really a weed we don't like, yes? Uh, and perhaps you have some of the species here, I'm not sure. But if you take the seeds, it, from the seeds you can produce 60 kilogram per hectare of angicillin. And the price for angicillin is 128 euros per 10 milligram. And if I, it's, it's millions of <laughs> So extremely expensive for 10 milligrams. So you can forget all the other part of the plant if you can extract that kind of fine chemical. And you can see it can be used for posteriores and cancer treatment. That's why it's that expensive. So I think this is the future for farmers to produce 
not biomass just for food or feed or fuel, but also for the pharmaceutical, so on, the chemical industry. And then they need your knowledge, yes? Yeah. Yes? So, I, I like this figure too, a little drawing, because we try, of course, to make environmental and sustainable production of biomass, and of course, also the residues and waste. And then, in a way, in a biorefinery, we do this, what we need to split our biomass into all those products you know from the pyramid. And then we, as I wrote with this, I may handmade made line, we, we circulate the nutrients and we have no waste. So this is, in a way, the hope for the future. Yes, and now a little bit more technical. <laughs> I hope you can see it from the distance. Uh, I can from here at least. Uh, yes. Good. So we have on the left hand side the different uh, crops, uh, sugar crops, like, yeah, we can take that afterwards. Uh, starch crops, like cassava, for instance, uh, potatoes, and so on, and, and grasses. The next one is from the wet cultivation, then we talk about seaweed, algae, and so on. And then we have the primary residues, as if, like roadside grass, which you cut along the road, wood pruning waste, fibers, bark, leaves, and so on. So this is residues. Then they talk about secondary residues here, black liquor from paper production, pulp, and the oil cake from the oil pressing of oil seeds. And then we have the last one, still residues, that is animal fat from the slaughtery. This is very good for biodiesel, vegetables, fruit, and garden waste. So in a way, my topic today is primary, secondary, and tertiary waste or residues. Then, now I'm collect all my biomass, and then I need to convert it into this pyramid of bioeconomy. And first I need to split my plant so I can make the best uh, conversion process. So if I have a wet material, I will do hydrolysis and, and fermentation. Uh, perhaps I need some enzymes or yeast in between, or for the more dry part, I might do thermochemical, like gasification, pyrolysis, combustion, and so on. Yes, so we split it and find appropriate conversion processes to produce the products on the right-hand side, and then it's still circular. Yes, I, I can see we are not there yet, but we can have a goal of, of achieving this. I hope you share that wish. Yeah. Yes. Okay, just one example from Norway, what they call the world's most advanced biorefinery in operation. And if you go for conferences in biofuel, you will meet people, and when you tell you are from Norway, ah, Borgo, yes. And what they did for many, many years, more than 100, is to make cellulosis for the paper industry from spruce, as a Pikea avias. And they did that for many years. You can see the timeline. But then they're starting to make fi fine paper, uh, specialty cellulosis, uh, textile fibers, and bioethanol. So they make ethanol from wood, which is the second generation, yes, uh, biofuel. And they do, so instead of just making one product from spruce, they are making 50 different products, including, of course, some energy, but also vanilla, different acids, um, 
lignosulfate, yeast they are producing. So in a way, they are earning money by not just making bioethanol, and then you have a lot of residues or waste. They are selling all, no waste. You can see this is fantastic. So it, for all factories, it should be like that, that you actually are utilizing all of the feedstock. Or you deliver your waste as a feedstock for the next neighbor factory. Yes. Yes? Yeah. And then the question, do, are you used to have a break? I think perhaps this is new. Should we take five minutes break? Is that fine? Five minutes break? I think this is very different for you. Yes? Okay. So, we have... Yeah, so... Uh, you didn't it okay if there was an always and you went for fresh air or something like that perhaps too warm outside <laughs> yes Do, did you find some questions in your brain during the break yes please Check, check. Okay, I'm Inda. I'm from Estate Crop Product Technology, now in the first semester. Uh, I want to ask about, like, you mentioned before that you are expert in thermochemical mm -mm, from biomass, right? So, uh, is it, like, very expensive to, I mean, like, to invest uh, to, the, to the combustion of the biomass than the result of the biomass, like the energy? Thank you. I think I more or less will answer that with the next slide in a way, uh, because the simplest conversion is actually to burn it, uh, fire into heat. That's an extremely simple way. So it's very efficient conversion and very cheap. You can do this with the fire. Perhaps not very efficient if it's for cooking, but at least you get the what. So the simplest and, and most known way is combustion. But then the next thing should you make steam and make electricity, which I, I have it actually here. If you see on the left-hand side, the most simple thermochemical is the combustion, where you have enough air for complete conversion of all uh, constituents. And if you make just hot water, you make heat. But if you make high temperature, Say 500, 550, you know, 500 degree, you get high pressure steam, which you can put into a steam turbine, like a small mill, and then you make electricity with a generator, it's like a gene set. And, and the remaining part is heat. So in, in, if you again go to Denmark, they use waste heat from combined heat and power. Uh, I think nearly 70% of the population have district heating, which mainly comes as waste heat. Yes. So that is a very easy way to do it. If we look into the gasification, even have been known for a long time, it's not very common to do because you already get some tars, hydrocarbons, which are sticky, and if you go into an engine, it will not last forever. And if you do syn gas and fissure drops, it's possible, but you have some practical issues. Yes. And, and the last one is the pyrolysis. Uh, and again, if you talk about hydrothermal, high pressure and liquid products, then we are in making a few liters per hour. We are not in the scale. If we talk about pyrolysis, then, you know, they make charcoal in big scale, but that is, in a way, a con cheap conversion process. But there exists, uh, Shell has a patent on hydropyrolysis, where they make a crude oil, but it's not developed yet. They have a lot of uh, experimental work in Bangalore, India, in a pilot plant, but not that successful. So I must say, on the left is is most developed and easy way is combustion and combined heat and power. 
Yes. Yeah. I think that is. But also possible in this case, they put shoe cells. And of course, you can take this gas from gasification into a fuel cell. But again, it needs to be a high temperature of fuel cell with a clean gas, which is challenging. Yes. So there are some research to do for you in the future. Yes. <laughs> we need you. Yeah. I hope that's answered your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? No? Okay, but please just interrupt me. Yeah. So that was on the left hand side where we use temperature and on the right hand side we have what you know that anaerobic digestion to biogas to an engine for combat heat and power or for upgrading could be or yes and then we have the as a from low content to natural gas quality then we have fermentation, where distillation, you know, have to come back. And we have the pressing or chemical extraction of oil, and then further the esterification. And we can have, after that, high, uh, hydro treatment to make more pure uh, gasoline molecules. So I will have one slide on the warm thermochemical side. That is this one, because in a way it gives the principle, and I made some additions here. So combustion is a simple one, where we have excess amount of the oxygen, of oxygen in air, and we say we, lambda means we have more than necessary for complete combustion. High temperatures, gasification, then we have some oxygen, some of the oxygen, but not enough, and we have now some. And then we need to have, uh, normally we go up around 800, but we start to get gases at this level. The pyrolysis, the charcoal production, no air, just heat. And when we heat it above uh, normally 400 degrees or more, then we get this pyrolysis oil and a gas. and that's this one. And the first the upper one was this kind of mild pyrolysis around 200 degree, where we just get rid of some of the gases and we decompose some of it. So this is, in a way, as I see, a nice introduction to thermochemical con conversion. And the main difference is the amount of oxygen the oxygen. The time is also, is if you make a few seconds heating of sawdust, then we get liquid wood. Then we get a lot of, of oil instead of charcoal. Flash paralysis is the name. Yeah. Okay, then let's go back to your field. <laughs> we start on the left hand side with different residues. Uh, and you see the sources, animal, food processing, and so on. So I think this slide is perfect for your study program. Yes. And then we have the goal of no dumping, burning landfill. And then we try to, of course, to reduce the amount of residues and waste. And then we can create bioalcohol, biodiesel, biohydrogen, biogas. And as you know, biohydrogen is not that developed. And if we have those chemicals, we can make platform chemicals for the chemical industry, like sugars, polymers, uh, butane, diol, lactic acid, and so on. And we can convert it further to single cell uh, proteins, uh, uh, oil actually, and proteins. So if we are able to make good conversion processes, there are no limitations in what we can achieve. No. It's just the chemistry. No. And the processes we use is the blue one when we talk about the biochemical anaerobic digestion, where we get methane, fermentation, bioethanol, transesterification, biodiesel, 
and microbial microbial fuel cell. That is not very developed either. This is something to do in the lab and have fun. Uh, I made very small current or voltage and then be extremely satisfied. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one is this uh, fermentation where you make hydrocarbons. Uh, on the top you see actually one of the pyrolysis units from PET. And then I put, we have this for the dry material, we can make the thermochemical conversion. Yes, now I'm approaching your field. <laughs> so, so when we make ethanol, we start normally with sugar or starch. And normally the crops for me are corn, that's also for North America, even maize, sugar beets, so potatoes, and grain. Well, corn, potatoes, and grain are the starch crops. And then depending on is it sugar or not, we add acid or enzymes and make sugar for fermentation. And then we go further on. And the fun stuff is in Europe, if you buy gasoline, petrol, then 10% of that is minimum ethanol, which means we import ethanol from Brazil and we don't produce it. Yeah. Um, and Actually, the f first fourth car was actually running on bioethanol. And, you know, if you start with sugar crops, you can just add yeast, ferment it, distill it, dehydrate it, and get 100% pure ethanol. And you, I'm sure you know, but the maximum concentration by distillation is... 95.6 percent. Yes. You have seen this before, haven't you? Yeah, I will not. Um, and starchy crops, which is normal when you make ethanol from grain and, and corn, then we need molds, and then we are in the sugar stage, sugar stage, and do the same. And if we are in the second generation biofuels, we start with root, add perhaps an acid, sulfuric acid, or we can just do enzyme, depending on how it is, hydrolysis, and then we continue the same route. Yeah, I will not go deeper in. And from this textbook I use for the students, you see they use here sweet sorghum. Sorghum is a very nice plant because you have the seeds, a starch crop, and you have the stalk as a sugar crop, yes. and then depending on the variety. But again, you get some residues, like the leaves, the bagasse, some solids, and, and water. So the main part is to utilize this, perhaps for further conversion into bioethanol. Yes. But since this is something you know, I continue. And I think this is interesting, at least for me, because how much do I actually get per, per hectare? And the highest yielding is the sugar cane and the sugar beet, yes, the more than five tons per hectare of, of ethanol. And the lower one here, are barley and cassava is a little bit better, yes. Yes. I will not. Yes, and then I will finish the ethanol, since that is what you know, with one example, which is successful in the technology way, but not economical. So in Denmark, since we are producing a lot of grain for all our pigs, perhaps 20 million pigs, I don't know, it was that at the time, then we have a lot of straw, which we use for heating, but they made a project, you can see for big bales, so every so one you see in total here are twenty six ton, twenty four bales a half a ton. So here are twelve tons of straw or the photo. And then they convert this straw very dry after wheat and, and barley production 
and make ethanol. So they start with milling the straw because you get a better yield if it's smaller particles. Then they do a hot hydrothermal uh, hydro is it hydrolysis and with enzymes and then they ferment it, distill it and separate the lipids a uh, lignin, sorry, lignin and then they get uh, in a way similar to molasses which can be used for biogas for instance and then we get venous also. So this is very successful, four tons of straw per hour working perfectly but no money. They don't earn money because the enzymes have a very high price. The straw is not that expensive. So the, especially the enzymes. So it just stopped. So it's ready when the enzymes are decreased and the ethanol prices are high enough. So yeah. So that was what I would like to say about bioethanol. And then I move into biogas, which is also your field. I will show perhaps some different scale. I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is a farm scale, but the farm has, I don't know, 1,000. Perhaps they produce 100,000 pigs per year or something like that, or more. And then the neighbors may complain that the straw from the pigs smells terrible and they don't like to be the neighbor then he said okay instead of having those complaints I make it into biogas because after the biogas production the smell or odor is much lower and then he will get less complaints the other part is also that it normally become more liquid which means it's easier to put into the soil so you get no evaporation so you get a better usage of the nitrogen from the slurry. Because the nice thing about biogas is you keep all the nutrients. Yes. And for biogas you can do everything. But here you just have one tank. That is this one. And then you have one pump to pump in, pump out. You have a new storage tank. And then you have this 100 kilowatt electric uh, DN set where he produces 100 kilowatt electricity and then heat to his the stables for the animals and for people working on the farm. Um, and as you know, we do something between 10 and 55. I will come back to the range we normally are using, depending on are we using uh, waste or residual from slaughteries, then we need higher temperature. Right? Or we need also a sterilization with a short heating. Yes. But then we make methane uh, and some CO2. And in, in Denmark, at least, it's very popular to say this CO2 together with hydrogen, then we can make more methane. And we take the hydrogen from electrolysis with surplus of electricity from our wind turbines. And again, in Denmark, not Norway, then sometimes we have a surplus of electricity only from the wind turbines. So the wind turbines can produce more and all the electricity we need in, in Denmark. Yes. And after this production, we can put that into a boiler, just make heat. Engine make just heat and electricity, like here. We can put that into a fuel cell, which is better than the uh, producer gas, it's more pure. Or we can make upgrade it to more methane or continue into methanol. And actually, do, do you have natural gas in Indonesia? Yes. No, okay. So in Denmark, we have a huge natural gas grid, like Germany, which has these difficulties with the war in Russia and Ukraine, uh, actually Ukraine. So they did not get the gas, the gas price increased. 
and they need to replace that with something else. But in Denmark, actually, last year, 34% of the natural gas grid, uh, gas, came from biogas. So in the future, they expect the natural gas grid is a biogas grid. So they upgrade the biogas to have more than 90% of, of methane, like the natural gas, and then you just introduce it to grid. And the nice thing is you can store it because we have huge reservoirs down below, we have removed salt. So you can store this biogas also in the ground and use it when you need it. So the very black natural gas is becoming more and more green. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you know the process. I just continue. So I just took photos from Piet. And you know, this is it not that small, but they have this unit where they put have you seen it? Have you seen this biogas plant? No. W will you see it later on? <laughs> okay, but at, at Piet they have, as a food set in agriculture, they have this place here where they take the manure from cows, some plants, and water, and get that into the reactor that is below here, and then they get out the slurry. But due to the very hot conditions you have, the slurry is nearly solid, <laughs> so not that easy to distribute afterwards. Uh, then I went to a cocoa a chocolate farmer, yeah, Gone Kit Chocolate on Wednesday. And he had, when you harvest the fruit from cocoa plants, then 75% is this uh, pot husk, which could be used and is here used in this small reactor. And of course, we have the beans and so on. But so he put five liters into this end, and then he pumped out yes, nearly the same. Uh, and then he take the gas from the top through a meter, and then to the cooking. So it's very nice invention from Sure Co. This is an innovation, yeah, which you know, I'm sure. This is also a part of our uh, community services uh, together with the other faculty, faculty of agriculture technology and also faculty of agriculture. So we have, uh, I believe the the cocoa farmer is also belongs to our faculty as before, belong to faculty of agriculture technology, Pak Parianto. And he told us that he has a problem with cocoa CPH, cocoa pot house. And he he wondered how to use it because if we put it on the ground, it causes a problem for the soil. If we put it uh, as normal, it will be become a problem of a fungi. So it's they start to think how we use it as a part for the bio. We call it bio bio energy. It's got fuel or energy. We saw it. Biogas basically. It's mostly it's bio biogas. And we uh, we have uh, some collaboration with the Shurko. So at the time, so uh, it's a part from our our community services. And I believe you saw it on last Wednesday, yeah, yeah, two days ago. Yeah. So this is a fine unit. The only thing, perhaps, is that when you have a biogas reactor, you put the material in, and then you will get some sediments by time in the bottom because you don't convert everything. There will be some remains. So by time, this will be filled with some sediments, which you should remove by time, so you have a more active volume in the reactor. You can also get some scum on the top, which can reduce the volume. You, uh, on the top, actually, you have the gas volume, because on the top, perhaps, 20% you or more is the gas volume of methane where you take the gas from. And then you have, let's say, 75, 80% with the 
reactive volume, but a part of this is this sediments. So the wheel volume is less, yes. And, and it's not easy in this unit to remove the sediments. There are no openings. You cannot just open it. So it's nice. It's completely airtight, which it should be, but it's not very easy to, in a way, remove the sediments. Yeah. So the next version should have no <laughs> possibility to get rid of the sediments to, to keep the production of, of gas. And he learned also that if he put some molasses into this, then he get a much better pressure because he needs to have this carbon nitrogen ratio and energy. Yes. Yes. So there are different types of reactors. You have the complete mixing, which typically are tanks like this, which I'm familiar to. The mixing can be mechanical or by a pump. Or you have the big units where you are putting three, four times per day feed in, and you take at the same time the feed out as a digestate state and the gas out. And in this case, it's possible to take this uh, switch out if necessary. And yes, and this is just batch. You feed it, make the gas, take it out. But there are other systems, yes. Fluidized systems, uh, sludge blankets, yes. But then it yeah, be a complete biogas lecture, yeah. Yes, and then you know perhaps you can get a lot of gas, 23 to 250 liters per kilogram. That means this reactor could give a lot if it, it was feeded, and then depending on the retention time, how much we get of this, because this is the potential. And the retention time is determined how much we get, yes, plus the temperature. And the thermodynamic efficiency is 60%. So compared to the combustion where we are above 90, it, it's different, yes. Yes, but then you, I will not talk about biogas. Then. I think I go. So I just want to be sure you know this. You might do, but so first of all, no air in anaerobic. Number two, we need a temperature. Have you learned how stable, how even should the temperature be? Because it needs to be stable because you have the bacteria, they adapt to the temperature. And if you change the temperature, then some other bacteria will take over. That takes time. So the more variation, the less gas production. So, okay, the rule of thumb is plus minus two degree. So it's nice you have a very even temperature here. <laughs> and it should not be in the sun because then perhaps you get 70 degree on that part, yes. So, it should be aware to keep the temperature as even as possible. And with your temperature, it is natural to be in the mesophile area. But we have some uh, plants where we are at the beginning of the 40s, especially when we use uh, waste or residues from slaughteries. Yeah. Yeah. pH is important, the substrate. And we need to cut it into pieces. If we really would like to get as much as we can, we need this ratio between carbon and nitrogen. Uh, too much straw gives us too much carbon. T having more proteins and legs like that, we get too much nitrogen. So we need to adjust it. Then we need steering, and we need to consider organic load. And, and then again, we have all this about inhibition from ammonia and so on. But I think you have. And of course, you need a certain amount of water. Normally, we have only 10% of dry matter or 90% of water because we like to pump it. And this can go through a pump up to the reactor, from the reactor to the tank afterwards, from the tank 
to the transportation to the field, we need we are really the pump. So in our system, we normally have around 90% of water. But the bacteria don't need that much water. It say that we should have, it, it can work with uh, down to 50% water. Yes. Yeah. So in order, and I can see why you are adding water here. Yes. This will not work. Yes. Yeah. And then the retention time. So this is more normal feedstock for us. You see, within three weeks, three weeks is the normal retention time on farm scale and bigger centralized uh, biogas plants in cities. That is three weeks. And you can see this is fine for grass, normally a silage. From stomach content, it could be longer. And you see for straw, it should be longer. But we normally say we stop here, because then we get more out of our reactor. And then perhaps we put it in a storage, where we still would take some of the methane. Yes. OK. And have you tried to make biogas this way with syringes? No? But you can, yes? Because an easy way to see the production, because it will press the piston in the syringe when you produce the biogas, so you can measure directly the amount of biogas produced. You can see that because this is free. Yeah, so you put your feedstock and bacteria in, and then you just set the, uh, you stop, uh, you block the needle, and then it will start pressing the piston. And you can see, okay, I got 20 milliliter of, of biogas. So, <laughs> but again, you need to have a right temperature, yes? You need to put this a warm, constant temperature place, yes? So this is possible. I have one who did this with biochar, try to see did this improve the gas yield or, or not. No. Yes, then I move to the, okay, any questions related to biogas? No? Okay. Yeah. Yes. The last main part is, is about the plant oil production, where we are using seeds, but also fruits, tubers, and roots is possible. And normally we do pressing, screwing it together, and so on, and we get 95% of the oil. If you use solvents, you get more. And again, interestingly, the first diesel engine ever was running on peanut oil. And you are, I have seen you are growing peanuts, so you have it available. But then we forgot it and moved into diesel, fossil diesel, which is much easier to use, of course. And what you see here is uh, wrapper, rape seeds going down in the press. One third is oil for people or for biofuel, and two thirds is a press cake or seed cake, which can be used to feed animals. And then we have the residues like straw and shells and so on. So all this can be used in the bioeconomy. Yes. And a long list of how is the seed content and just to have a few one, we can take cotton seeds, around 20% oil in the seed, and per hectare is just 0.29, 290 kilograms per hectare, which is low. Yeah, you see olive, which we are <laughs> growing the Mediterranean, you can have really high yield per hectare, and you have a high oil content. Yes, but what is the difference between oil and fat? For me, this is a nice definition, because fats, they are solid by room temperature, but your room temperature is different to mine. We normally talk about 22. <laughs> so which is solid by 22, that is fat, yeah. yeah. Yes? 
Yes, and we can also have oil from algae, but we need a, a yeast actually. And if they have a lack of nutrients, we try on killing the algae, then they will start producing more oil. But then they will die and we don't get them growing more. Yes. Yes. And then the next step, according to all the nice slides, is the conversion into fatty acid methyl esters. And have you tried this in real life, in lab? No? I will show you how to do it in big scale. <laughs> so what you do is you have the oil, and then you take around 10, 11% of methanol, the ethanol, and then you convert it into the same amount of biodiesel as you have of oil, and then you get 10, 11% of glycerin down here, yes? And the glycerin is fantastic for biogas. So the biogas farmer, he would like to buy that from you if it's not too expensive. And then it's separated for water and you get your fuel grade fame. Yes. And in real life, this is from a German farm, quite huge, because you see he have on the left hand side the plant oil. Yes. And then have the methanol coming in. So th this is one cubic meter, and then it has 30 cubic meter of uh, plant oil. And then he are producing the same amount of biodiesel. So it's equal. Yeah? 30 cubic meter of biodiesel for his tractors. He has a lot of tractors. And then the price on the market for rape or wrap oil is higher than for soybean. Then he sells his wrap oil and buy cheap soybean oil. And then this is the unit where he makes this process. So it's not that demanding. It's about mixing and temperature and time. Yes. Yes. And then you get oil. And if you compare the plant oil to diesel, you can see the viscosity by 20 degree is uh, 16 times what it is for diesel, for wrap oil. But if you increase the temperature, you are closer. And if you make fatty acid material, a wrap material ester, RME, you can see the viscosity by 50 degree is very similar to normal diesel. So that is what you do, you, you heat it. Yes. Now, either you heat the vegetable oil to a high temperature to become more liquid, low viscosity, or you make your uh, fatty acid methyl esters. And I have been driving behind a car running on pure vegetable oil, and it smells like somewhere you do uh, friture, yes, which you use a lot here. It's like uh, McDonald's, Burger King. What you say, you you are frying your food into plant oil, and that has a certain odor or smell. And if you're driving behind a car running on pure plant oil, you have the same smell yeah, on the highway. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then you can add hydrogen and make uh, hydrogenated vegetable oil, HVO, which have the same quality as gasoline, LPG, or diesel fuel. So then you just take your uh, RME and make hydrogenated and make normal molecules. Yes. Yeah, and then I stop the, the time is three o'clock. Or should, can I take five minutes more? Okay, five minutes more then, thank you. Okay, then I move a little bit into explaining this about the thermochemical. So I like this nice figure. I have a match, I ignite it. When it's warm, I get combustible gases, which was 70 to 80% of the weight. 
I get a flame and you are ready to ignite your candle. And the black stuff is the charcoal or char. Yes. And you can see the processes more here. First we have heating without air, that is pyrolysis. We get some vapors and then we get gas. They are cracking and we get lower gases, which burn, make suits and burn. And we get this nice uh, combustion gas, the flue gas from this single match. So what's happening here is the same as happening in a combustion system. So imagine then when you see a match next time that you have a complete combustion system where you also have pyrolysis because you have no air on the top of the wood here. The pyrolysis you have is hot due to the flame, but and for no air because the air cannot come down. So pyrolysis. Then you have some air coming down and you make gasification and then gasification. So all I mentioned here is happening on a match or piece of wood, yes. And then to explain how we use uh, charcoal for solar cell production, we have a huge kiln, six meters deep, where we add electricity to give heat, 2000. Then we add quartz, this white stone, which is silicon dioxide. Then we add coal and coke, which is extremely fossil, very black black, and we're making green solar cells, yes. But then we add some wood to make it greener, and we are trying to help them to put some charcoal instead of coke. And then you see the process is start with quartz, and then we need to reduce this to pure silicon, by a reductant, which is the carbon from charcoal. And you know from wood, half of that is carbon. And then we produce pure silicon for solar cells and, and carbon monoxide, which actually can go to a turbine and make electricity. So we have a used plant in the neighbor city having this process. Yeah. And we do also this in the lab. This is our small pyrolysis unit. The vapors come up. It's condensed here with cold water and cold water. So we get pyrolysis oil here. This is very tight. And then actually we try to put that back to the charcoal to make more char for the industry. Yes. And we also did combustion. And if you have high temperatures, in this case, from straw and husk pellets, as a husk from grain, then you can see by high temperatures, the ash is not powder, it's solid like concrete. And we don't like solid concrete in the combustor because it will block the system and we need to get rid with a hammer or something. So his PhD was on additives to reduce the tendency for melting the ash. If it's wood, then the melting is not a problem. They have very high temperature. But for straw and grain, it can take place around 1,000 degrees. We can measure that in a heating microscope in the lab, which we do. Yeah, And we did also biogas from, from wood, from, from, from willow, uh, salix, uh, and by steam explosion. By steam explosion, you have a high temperature, you release the, te the oh, sorry, you have a high pressure, you suddenly re release the pressure, and the plant cells are exploded, and you get a pasta which you can use for biogas. Yes, chemicals, I will I mention that. So, this is the final slides, and I will translate the title and that is soon we fight over the plants because we need the plants for everything yes yes that concludes my presentation so thank you for listening
There are time for questions, I hope, there, if you have. Thank you. I want to ask about biofuel for automotive, uh, for cars, for example. Uh, do you? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, fuel uh, biofuel can match the performance from uh, fossil fuel? Because we know uh, high performance engines need uh, high performance fuel. Okay. okay. Yes, the short answer is yes, because the last I showed you, if you, uh, I go back to the, this hydro treatment. So here you start the vegetable oils, and with the oils, yeah, of course, you clean them and so on. But then you add hydrogen, you take water out, and in this process, you get pure molecules like gasoline. So you, you get exactly the same molecules as you have in gasoline or petrol. Or if, depending on the conditions, you get longer, bigger molecules, like diesel molecules. And then, so you get exactly the same molecules. So even you have a high performance engine, you have exactly the same molecules. So that's number one. And if I go the gasification, if you do this fissure trop uh, synthesis, then also you can decide the length of the molecules you will have, how many C's and how aromatic and so on. So it's just a matter of chemistry, you can get exactly the same molecules and therefore use them in all kinds of engines. It's like a bio refinery, like the petrol refinery. Yes. So that was the short and long answer. Yeah. Okay, this one is happening. So I can say the county I live in, to become more green, they have moved into HVO, as a hydro-treated vegetable oils. So all the lorries, as a, which are diesel fuels in, in our county, with a lot of municipalities, they are running on this today. So it starts from vegetable oil. Problem is, if they start from palm oil, so they have this, we don't buy HVO from palm oil based. No? Yeah, because yeah, you rain fast and so on, yes. So yes, this is taking place now. The fissure drops is not taking place now. No? They did during the Second World War, but you have forgot to do it, yes. Mm. So this is actual. Yeah. That that's answer your question? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. The, the no, electric. Okay, I come from Norway, where most of the sold car, new cars, are electric. Yes, and I think half of all cars are electric. So, but on the other hand, Norway has a strategy, a politics, where they, on one hand, subsidize electric cars, and the infrastructure related to that. On the other hand, they have requirement that you put to have 20% of bio f fuel into the diesel and, and petrol. Yes. So they do both. But if you go to Denmark, they don't like biofuels. <laughs> so we export the vegetable oil to Germany because they like it, yes. Because they think if you use biofuels, like wrap oil, vegetable oil, that the emissions are the same due to you get a little bit more particles and more nitrogen oxide in the emissions from the engine. 
So in Denmark, they say, no, we will not. But Norway say 20%. And they have achieved that goal. But they do this by saying that advanced biofuels, they have a factor of two. So if they do ethanol from wood that, or from waste, they have a factor of two. Then they can just have 10, and then they multiply by two. Yeah. Politics. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then we just stop and thank you very much for coming.